So the topic is building the next generation of corporate leaders, but that doesn't necessarily mean just corporate leaders. Uh, I started a side business and recently wrote a book, and apparently when you do things in business and marketing, you're supposed to have a niche. So I went towards corporate leaders, not just like everyone, because then no one knows who I'm talking to. But this message generally applies for everyone. So I'm going to go over four different topics today. One, how did I get here? Why did I get here? What brought me to this point? Uh, the business world today, the future of work, and how to prepare for the future of work. Uh, one of my passions outside of technology and product management is leadership and helping make a, I guess, a more fair and stable and equitable work environment for everyone, uh, which I don't think currently exists today. Uh, myself, I've been through, I think I'm up to like 13 or 14 companies right now, and I can count on a very few fingers on one hand of how many managers or leaders I've had that I respected, and I really, really enjoyed working for. Back in the day, 15, 20 years ago, I used to argue the point that leadership is something that you are born, it is, it is innate, but I have since, through my own learnings, found out that that is very short-sighted that this is something that can be taught, this is something that can be learned, you can grow as a person. Everyone has the opportunity to do that. And so the, the reason that kind of got me to that point is uh, some of the stuff I'm gonna talk about first, and then we'll go through some other topics, and then I'm gonna talk very briefly about the book I wrote, because I, it would be a very long presentation if I decided to write, or talk about all of the stuff within the book. Uh, but it's uh, at least give you a synopsis and, and give you a, a viewpoint on where I think the world is going, especially with, with the corporate culture and things that we've seen in the last year or so with COVID and economics and the stuff that we're still seeing to this day. So, how did I get here? Um, what year was this that I did this? Back in 2019, I was working for Syngenta here at the Research Park, and I had some full-time people, and I had some interns, and I thought I was just absolutely fucking crushing it at my job <laughs> as a leader. And then the company brought in a leadership group uh, from the, uh, the like a leadership circle, I think is what they were called, the 360 profile, and this was my profile that my interns and my full-time employees fill out for me, and I found out that I was 41% effective. So what the crazy part about this is, is the little black lines that are in here is where I rated myself. And then the green lines are where everyone else rated me. So there's a huge discrepancy in a lot of these places on how I viewed myself versus how I was actually interacting with other people. And this like blew my mind, like absolutely blew my mind because I was like, I'm doing great at this. This is amazing. Everyone is having a great time. Well, it turns out I sucked at a lot of things. And it was part of that kind of, that closed mindedness on my growth and how I was getting to the point of where I was, was at at that point. So one Sunday, I was out raking leaves. I have massive trees in my yard, and it takes literally two months to rake all the leaves out. Uh, I have since automated that by buying a, a lawnmower and something that picks it up for me. But I don't know why. I still do not remember the reason. But I put the audio book of Extreme Ownership on, and I listened to it the whole time I was raking leaves. It's like a six, seven hour book. I listened to the whole thing. Like I raked the entire day because this book was so good. Like I was taking notes the whole time I was doing it. When I got done with the book, I then went inside and was like, here's all the stuff I'm going to change at work. Made a plan for my team. Came in, like everyone got in. I was like, hey, shut your laptops. We're all going to talk. Like, shit is changing today. We are, we are moving on from the way that we are currently operating. And so then I started to dive into a lot more books. And a lot more books and a lot more books. And it's probably, I'm up into the couple hundreds now. I, I shouldn't say I read them. I listen to all of them as I drive or I mow the lawn or I do different stuff. But it was a way for me to learn new things and to grow in what I wanted to do and the things that I was passionate about. A world that hadn't really been opened up to me because I thought reading was dumb and it was slow and it was something that I didn't need to do because I had all this real world experience. Well, it turns out there's a lot of other people in the world who have great experiences that I can't have because I'm not them. And so from that, then I grew into actually getting a mentor, which I had never really had before. This is... Uh, Faraz, he's an old boss of mine, which is still a mentor to this day that I talk to on a fairly regular basis about different topics that come up uh, with my current job or uh, we bounce some different ideas and stuff back and forth. But it was at that point when I thought that I was doing great with that 360 review that all things were good and I, I didn't need to really work on myself or, or do some of these other things. And so I said, let's, let's take a step back. It took a lot of humility 
because anyone who knows me knows I have a fair bit of arrogance about me. I see heads shaking quite heavily, some people. Uh, they know this about me. But also I think hopefully those same people know that I, I do have a bit of humility and understand how to keep my ego in check, which is something we'll talk about a little bit, something I learned from that Extreme Ownership book. And one of the things that, that I firmly believe to this day, and I, I can't really, haven't been proven wrong on this, is ego is the number one killer of careers. It's the number one killer of a lot of things. It's the number one killer of a lot of businesses. Just because they say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to stick with this, I'm not going to change this one thing, because you think it's right, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, different conversations you have at work and how you can understand when ego is in play versus when you're having conversations about actual data and moving stuff forward uh, with what you're trying to build. So about, so seven months later, I wrote it down. Seven months later, I redid this. And in seven months and about 30 or 40 books and a ton of mentorship, I over doubled, yeah, over doubled my effectiveness as a team. And so within this, uh, it was a lot of the same people with a few new people. The, the report took into the nuance of the new people and having been with me for a little bit of time, but it helped me understand where I was going. And so from the, like at this point, uh, I was an offer from Syngenta to open and uh, uh, move positions to be head of product and engineering for Syngenta and open an office up in Chicago. And I got to hire like 25, 26 different people, which is something I wouldn't have gotten to do if I was that previous person. And so a lot of this stuff that I then started to disseminate through my team and got to see that team that I built grow. And so it was a good kind of feedback loop into seeing like how does this work in the real world and something that I then put together into the book that I wrote. So published, no one paid me. I, if that matters to anyone, it's not on Amazon because um, I don't want them taking my money. Uh, but the business world today is definitely changing. And I think a lot of the stuff that we're seeing right now is only going to, in my mind, get horrifically worse if we don't make some changes fairly soon. So automation is a big thing that is killing jobs. Uh, this is for coal mining that starts back in the 80s through now, where you see the production of coal versus how many jobs that it actually had. And a lot of people, uh, especially when, when Trump was in his presidency, talked to the coal miners and says, I'm gonna bring coal mining back because it's the regulations that are killing jobs. It is absolutely not. It is automation that is killing jobs. Automation is killing more jobs than we realize right now, and it's only going to get significantly worse. So this piece too, this is not something I've been able to have a whole lot of data on, but it's something that I firmly believe that is going to push more people towards automation. As we start to see very few people going back to work from COVID, there is a multitude of reasons that this is happening. Uh, we're starting to see a lot of people who are uh, confronted about lower pay or health insurance or benefits in their job uh, versus people who don't want to go back to a job that is minus minimum wage or near minimum wage because you can't survive off of it. And so there's this survival shift that we're starting to see that's happening in the, in the working world. And the only thing that that's going to do is it's going to push corporations towards automation. Because how are they going to get and provide the services that they need if they don't have the people? Well, they're going to hire computers to do the job for these people. And so, like, this is a picture of the sign I took at uh, Taco Bell. It's like, please do the task because the kiosk because we're understaffed. How many people have actually gone into a place and actually ordered from the restaurant now versus having to use the kiosk? It's happening a lot more. That is automation taking jobs away that once existed. Maybe those are jobs that people don't necessarily want. I would argue that it's not a job that someone doesn't want. It's a job that hasn't been presented in a way or has been published in a way that you can make a living and not live on starvation wages or have to go on government assistance just to keep that low wage job. So the other factor that I've seen in this, and I've seen this sign in other places, uh, this is a McDonald's sign, I've seen the same thing out of a Burger King when I was in Indiana, is they're trying to hire high school kids. Because $9 to a high school kid is a shit ton of money. I pay my kid $5 an hour, and he is ecstatic, and he's 17, he thinks he's got all of the money in the world. So what happens when these high school kids can't fill in the jobs during the day or whatever? Again, it's going to push all of these companies towards automation. The number one reason I don't think, or I believe, uh, that automation doesn't already exist in fast food restaurants is because people, I don't think, want to eat at a restaurant that has most of the, uh, the food automated. Partly because it's a perception issue. One, 
how do we know that that actually cooked my burger? Is, is the, the computer doing the right things? But also people want to have people helping and serving them. There's, a, there's an emotional connection or something that happens within that that automation can't currently overcome, but I don't think that's going to be the case for much longer. So the reason I believe all of this, and I think I mentioned this before, is corporations exist to make money, period. That is why they exist. They exist for nothing else. So there are corporations such as Tesla, who I'm a big fan of, their mission statement, uh, something along the lines of accelerating uh, sustainable energy to help make a more climate-friendly planet or something along those lines. They want to do that to help make the planet a better place, but they cannot do that if they don't have money. So that is corporations exist to make money, period. So if the corporation can automate your $75,000 a year job to increase profits, they will. That is not just any job. That is all jobs. We're going to see a disruption. Hopefully I'm wrong on this. There are other um, professors and uh, people who have studied this for much longer, Kaku Lee being one of them, who I'll talk about here in a second, uh, believes that this is going to be the case. Same thing with uh, Sundar Boshe at Google, uh, believing that automation is going to replace 40% of jobs possibly within the next 15 years. This was written in 2019. And a lot of people believe, I forget what my next slide is, uh, a lot of people believe that certain jobs are safe. Any job that has a repeatable task is not safe. So as a great example, a lot of people would say, I'm going to get a job as a doctor because a, job, a doctor role will be sustainable for some time. That's correct. AI is better at doctors at uh, performing or diagnosing multiple different things within the human body, like specifically the one that I found was within breast cancer. And they yes. might even have a company that's doing that in the room. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so, so exactly. So if, if, if we look at this to where we say doctors are... Uh, like could be like a safe role for someone to be in, that, that's not the case. We are going to see some shift in jobs that exist, but we are still going to see more jobs displaced. And I often hear the argument of, well, this happened in the, um, the Industrial Revolution. This is completely different than what we saw in the Industrial Revolution. There was a misplace of jobs and a change of jobs, but they were recreated in new ways. Here we're going to see complete job markets destroyed. So you're going to see all of these... Uh, cancer diagnosticians replaced by one computer across the globe. So what does that mean for the future of work? There are things that AI can't do. AI, at least in America, some countries this won't be the case, AI is not going to be the one to provide bedside manner or help you emotionally get through breast cancer or some other nasty disease that you may have. There are still going to be humans that perform those jobs. So you could get into a medical role of having to become a full-fledged doctor and spend eight plus years in it, you could go four years in, get more of a psychological degree, where you then become emotional support for patients who have these nasty, horrific diseases. But we've already lost all the doctors, right? Like, so those, those jobs aren't coming back. It's not happening right now, but it will happen in the future. Because again, corporations exist for one thing, that is to make money. They can't be in existence if they are making money. They're not doing stuff for free. They are not nonprofits. So, I have some questions for this, uh, before I get into my next thing. I don't want everyone to answer this out loud, but think of the answer. If I asked you, we met, I said, who are you? How would you answer that question? <coughs> so my guess is, most of you, if you were to describe yourself to me, you include something about your job. Raise your hand if in your answer to that first question, who are you, you included something about your job. Okay, this fair number of the room. I would too. So the issue with this is, a lot of us take security and have a connection to our job. The people we work with, we have an emotion, it gives us purpose, it gives us a sense of accomplishment. So what happens when you take 40% of the jobs that exist today and go away with them? You have a bunch of really depressed people. <laughs> you have a bunch of suicidal people. You have a significant increase in male-female households, or even male-male households, of domestic violence. There are all of these things that are going to topple on top of this 40% loss of jobs. And again, I don't think, or I don't fully know that this is going to happen. This is purely a projection. I would rather err on the side of caution than to not do anything about it and have everything go to shit. Because we saw a significant increase in multiple issues 
when COVID and lockdowns and stuff started happening last year. Or we saw police violence or other things that started to increase civil unrest. So what happens when you have a bunch of people that don't have enough money? So a lot of people say, oh, universal basic income will be a great way for us to progress forward. Well, it's not, because if you go back to this slide, many people in society are still going to be without purpose. And so that becomes a mental health problem that we aren't going to overcome with just simply giving people money to uh, meet that hierarchy of, of needs. So the other question I have for you, what is a leader? And I will, I will take, and if anyone has read my book or has had a conversation with me about this, please do not answer the question. <laughs> what is a leader? Anyone, raise your hand, blurt it out, I don't care. Who has a definition of what you think a leader is? Go for it. I feel like it could be someone who, like, guides the people that they're leading in a direction that um, almost like kind of makes them feel like they're they're putting in their effort independently and guides other people uh, to make them feel included and feel like they have a purpose in the project or situation or business or corporation. Okay. Anyone else? He knows how to manage a particular individual. He knows how to manage different people. Mm -hmm. Different people. Go ahead. Uh, I would say someone who has a uh, well-defined vision and goal and can convince other people to also believe in that vision. Okay. Anyone else? So you're all close. The definition that most of you gave was the definition of leadership. A leader is someone who has followers, period. And the reason I bring this up is because it is a very key distinction of what a leader actually is. Because a lot of you will see, uh, i got a couple slides next. A lot of you will say something like, oh, it's someone who is um, charismatic. It's someone who is uh, trusting. They have uh, high emotional intelligence. They are uh, trustworthy. There's a different word I'm looking for. Um, it was like the top skill everyone said they needed in a leader, which I generally think is bullshit because a leader is someone who has followers. How you get those followers is unique to you. So the next slide I have, which one of these is a leader? Trump Biden. The answer is both, because they both have followers. As much as you may like or dislike, and the reason I picked this is because there's probably polarity in how much you like and dislike either person on this side, they're both leaders. You cannot argue that point because they have followers. It is very clear that both of these have followers. You cannot argue the point that one of these is not a leader. So with that being said, it gives you the opportunity to be a leader at any point in your life. You don't have to have a title. You don't have to be president. You don't have to be... CEO, you don't have to be a director. It doesn't matter. You have the opportunity to shape how you want to be as a leader. And the reason that's important within the definition is that each human is unique. Every single person in this room has had a different life. If you have a twin, your twin has even had a different life than you. You've had different experiences. That means you are a different person. And so why is that valuable? Because unique life gives you unique ways to solve challenges. And so if you prescribe to a leader as someone who is uh, trustworthy, confident, arrogant, whatever you want to throw in there, then you misinterpret what you can do for yourself as a leader. So you become someone that you think other people want you to be, and you don't become the person who you actually could be. And so the frustration with that is, is a lot of people will go down this path and say like, oh, I need to be a leader, I have to be able to do these things. Well, if you start becoming someone else, humans are fairly good at detecting bullshit, and they won't want to be a follower of you. And so you have to use your uniqueness in a way that allows you to become a leader for these different individuals. And so this slide, I thought I'd put it a little bit closer. Talk about a boss, someone who drives employees, someone who inspires fear versus a leader, someone who coaches and says, we, gives credit, let's, let's go. I've never had a leader that has said, let's go. Like, because what this is, <clears throat> is this is the definition of whoever created this on this side of what they look for in a leader. So as a leader, you become unique to yourself. You take your skill sets, you build those, you grow stronger. Because it's much simpler to increase your strengths than it is to look at all of your weaknesses and try and build those weaknesses up. And so the reason I present this is that if you say, this is what the definition of a leader is, I want to become this person, but you aren't a person who has great goodwill, that doesn't matter. Because you will find followers in your own way and then you can help lead them on the mission and take them to the place that you want to take them. So, a good example of this is Steve Jobs. And I'm totally blanking on the word that everyone said they wanted in a leader, a certain characteristic about being um, 
Having followers? <laughs> no, it's uh, that's that. Having it's, vision? It's not a vision. It's uh, trustworthiness. Integrity. Um, integrity. There we go. Yes. So everyone says to be a leader, you have to have integrity. Well, Steve Jobs used to buy a car every six months because in California at that time, you didn't have to register your car up until six months. So he would buy a new car every six months so that no one ever knew his car was his. So he could park it wherever the hell he wanted to. Some would argue that that is Steve Jobs being out of integrity. But Steve Jobs is a clear leader because he has millions of followers for the work that he did in his lifetime. So some of you earlier, specifically you, gave a very close definition to what I think leadership is. There's a difference between someone who is a leader and someone who is in a leadership position and what leadership activities need to take place. Leadership is the process of influence which maximizes the ability of others to achieve a common mission. And so that's where it gets into the point of you and your corporation, if you want to become a leader and you want to change the game and be able to do things for other people or accelerate your career, was essentially the entire reason that I wrote the book that I did. Oh, I didn't know that slide was next. Crush that. Um, so I wrote this book again because there is this uh, thing within marketing and you have to like phrase stuff. So I called it the dynamic corporate leader method. Uh, one, because it was relatively easy to say and it's easy for me to describe to people. But it's what I call as a counterintuitive method to go from wherever you are as an individual contributor or whether you're a director to now and you want to get up to a VP or a president, there's a set of skills in which you must possess. And so my piece of this book is honing in on those skills and what those are. I broke the book into three sections. The first one is mindset. The second one is working smarter. And the last one is about building teams. Today, I only want to talk about the mindset one uh, because I wasn't 100% certain how long uh, I would want to talk and I want to leave a chance for uh, comments or some discussion later. So I'm going to go over the first uh, section in detail and then we'll cover the last uh, two <coughs> rather quickly. So within mindset, I look at this as, if you want to help other people, this is one of my favorite Jay-Z lyrics, he says, I can't help the four but one of them, so I got rich and I gave back, to me that's the win-win. So you can't necessarily help other people if your mind is messed up. I don't mean in a psychological or depressed way, but if you do not feel that you can succeed, then you aren't going to ever necessarily put yourself in a great position to help other people. And so the first entire section of my book is talking about mindset. So the first chapter I have is ownership, because this was foundational in my transformation towards what I was able to accomplish and what I've helped other people accomplish. Ownership to me is always taking ownership of what happened in any given situation and never pointing fingers. So let's say as an example, at work I have a, a, a product designer that reports to me. I asked her to do some research and the research and stuff I got back was not what I was expecting. Is that her fault or is that my fault? It is 100% my fault in an ownership scenario because I either didn't explain it to her well enough what I was looking for, I didn't guide her and give her the, the, the proper education or the training on the things that she needed to do. But a lot of people in this situation could just say, oh, you didn't do this and yell at you and I've had managers just constantly berate me for this one thing when I wasn't ever put in a position to uh, be in a place of success. And so when it comes to ownership, one of the things that Jocko taught was, uh, when you have an outcome of something that didn't go the way you planned, ask yourself these three questions. How could I have better prepared for this situation? What could I have done ahead of time to make sure that this situation didn't happen? And then what behavior could I have changed before, during, or after this happened? And then how could I have communicated better? And this is a very quick walkthrough of saying, oh, this didn't work. Let's try and diagnose what it was that caused us to get to this point. And then from that, you can help iterate and hopefully never get to that point again in that particular situation. The other one that's big for me is empathy. So you have two types of empathy. You have effective empathy and you have cognitive empathy. The first one is the sensations or feelings you get into the response to other one's emotions. So if you feel sad, they feel sad, whatever it may be. The cognitive empathy is your ability to understand and identify with people's emotions. And this is not something that you need to be born with. It is something that can be taught and you can work through it by asking a buttload of questions. The place I learned this, again going back to books, was uh, Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. He talks about empathy in a way that uh, he's able to have conversations with other people that really get them to open up, asking a lot of whole bunch of open-ended questions. And so once I understood that point, I was like, well, this sounds very similar to the design thinking process, which the first step of that is empathy, 
defining the problems, ideating on some solutions, and then iterating through those. And so empathy comes into uh, the working world in multiple different ways. My favorite is just making a connection with other people. So Chris Voss teaches something that's called mirroring. It's where you get into a conversation with someone, and then when they finish a sentence, you respond to them with the last two or three words in which they said in the form of a question. People love talking about themselves. I've been doing it for 30 minutes now. Um, they will continue to talk if you continue to ask them questions. And the great part about this is, is a lot of places, uh, especially in, in different corporate environments I've worked in, are very cold. Everyone is there to do their widget job, and they don't want to have interpersonal relationships and or their superficial interpersonal relationships. If you want to excel in what you do, very specifically, if you want to excel in becoming a leader and getting followers, getting to know other people and doing stuff for them, even if it's the most minor thing, will start to gain you followers in a very quick and a very real way. So for example, let's say you are uh, working in a large corporation that sells liquid in cans, and you have to put together a PowerPoint presentation once a month and present it to the chief whatever guy he was. Um, and you have to go across the corporation, across the globe, and ask people for a bunch of data. And they never give it to you. And then you get pissed. And so you go talk to their manager and say, hey, Johnny didn't give me data. Chief guy's going to be mad. And then Johnny gets yelled at from his manager. When in reality, you could have gone to Johnny and figured out, Johnny, what, what's happening, man? Like, can we, can we have a, a conversation? Can we talk? Like, let's find out what's going on in Johnny's life. Because you may find out that Johnny just had a kid. He sleeps two-ish hours a night. He's very behind on all of his work because someone else in his department quit. So rather than going a path that gets Johnny in trouble, go directly to Johnny. Treat him like a person, individual. Learn what's going on in his life or her life, whatever it may be, and get to the root of the problem and figure out how you can help them. So in an example with this, it was I asked uh, a particular individual to give me information in a PowerPoint, which they had to take from an Excel sheet, put it into a PowerPoint, make it look all pretty. That took them a couple hours each week to do this. And so what I said is just give me the Excel sheet. If you can automate that and just email it to me every Monday, all the lives are going to be better. So we did that. Johnny didn't yell at anymore. I didn't have to yell at Johnny. I didn't have to yell at Johnny's boss. But I wouldn't have done that if I wasn't actually taking the time to get to know Johnny. The second place you get to do this is within negotiations. So if you use cognitive empathy to ask a bunch of conversations to either a superior or you're interviewing for a new job and you're trying to negotiate a salary, if you can understand the point in which they have their reasoning based on, which you won't get to unless you start to ask a bunch of questions and dig down a bunch of different lines, then you can actually effectively negotiate. So I've been in a situation multiple times where I have uh, a boss that, and I, I say I've been, uh, most of us and most of the people I've worked with, is you have a boss that assigns you some new special project that is the most high priority thing in the world that needs to get done next week. And then they micromanage the shit out of you throughout that entire process. And micromanaging sucks, don't do it. I write about it in the book. There's tons of research that says <laughs> it's awful. Um, and it will actually demoralize your employees. Yeah? Did you say you wrote about it in the book, or you read it in the book, or you wrote no, it? No, I wrote about it. Okay. I wrote about it in the book. I wrote it once. Yeah, so <laughs> with, within that, um, what's that? <laughs> so I've experienced, I'm sure most of us have experienced, but ultimately, uh, micromanaging comes from a lack of trust. And so the bosses I had at that time didn't feel like I could hit the deadline that they gave me, so they wanted to micromanage me and other people. And micromanaging 100% comes out of trust. If the person doesn't trust you to excel at what you're trying to do, then they are going to micromanage you. You have to shore up that trust. And it's not on them to build trust with you. It is you on you taking ownership to build trust with that person. And if you don't do that, then you're going to sit in this endless loop of just being angry the entire time. So again, that's what cognitive empathy comes in. Talk with the boss. Find out why this project is so important. Well, maybe it's because his or her boss is yelling at him to get this project done, and they're amounting like extreme pressure within that. So then follow that line to figure out how the two of you can work together or even take it up a level to figure out how you can negotiate through that situation so not everyone's life has to suck. So the other, uh, chapter three, we get an ego. So ego is a big piece that uh, I should put some of the definitions and stuff up here. Uh, but I'm sure we all have, have a relative understanding or would think we understand what the ego is. Ego could be a positive or a negative thing. Oftentimes it comes out as a very negative thing. Most of the definitions people have for ego, or if I were to ask you the same question I think with leadership, you would come out and say, well, ego is negative this, negative this, negative this. 
it's also a positive thing. It's something that drives you. But if you don't sit in uh, the position and understand when ego is driving what it is that you are doing, you're going to alienate a lot of different people that you work with. And so we've all had conversations in which we want to produce something. Being a product manager, my entire life is about producing solutions that help solve problems. There are many times that I have had bosses, and every product manager goes through this, have bosses telling you that that idea is not going to work, my idea is better, just build my idea. If that boss doesn't have data, they're arguing purely based on ego. That happens in a multitude of situations, and it's easy for you to see it in other people, not as easy for you to see it in yourself. And so the, the big piece that I have as a takeaway from ego on this is making sure that you can recognize and understand when you aren't arguing or being fair to the other person, you're arguing to protect yourself, your emotions, so that you don't feel negative towards whatever outcome happened or they don't pick your idea or you don't get picked for the team and you're all pissed because you're the best player. So chapter four, we're going to build your why. Why is something that's uh, pulled in from Simon Sinek and gave it my own little spin. Simon Sinek positions a lot of his why statements around uh, what corporations do. So Tesla, uh, within their what, they build cars. How do they do it? They have robots that build cars. Uh, that's another industry that's been crushed by automation uh, up to this point. They build cars, but why are they doing it? Well, they're building electric cars to have a more sustainable environment that it doesn't rely on fossil fuels. That is their why. That is something that we can emotionally connect with. So if I were to ask all of you what you do, there is a high likelihood that you're just going to come back, my job title is X. And so the easiest one for me to pick on this is accounts. Because accountants, I don't know why I find it boring. It's probably because I barely passed accounting in college, and so it's really frustrating. Um, but I just found it was a, a very boring profession. So accountants come back and say, oh, I'm an accountant. Cool, that is the most boring thing that you could possibly say to me. But if you were to rephrase it in your own why statement, it's something along the lines of, I help manage the finances, let's say you work at a healthcare company, uh, so that we can provide low-cost healthcare solutions to our customers who are taking care of their aging parents' health. Like, all of us generally have parents, and we want them to be happy, especially later in life. We may have to take care of them, depending upon health and whatever other issues that may come to. And if a company offers healthcare services, it's not just we are offering healthcare services. We are offering something for you in an emotional way for you to help better take care of someone that you love in your life. And so same thing that goes into becoming a leader and trying to get followers. If you just come and say, I am an accountant, you aren't going to get followers unless there are other really boring people who just say, I want to also be an accountant. There's more to accounting. There's more to engineering. There's more to every job that you have. And the reason I talk about this is because 95% of our decisions for purchasing are based on our subconscious. So as an example, if I look around the room, pretty much no one is wearing the same thing. But the purpose of clothes is to protect us from the environment and also because probably being naked in public is frowned upon for some reason. Uh, so the clothes we decide to buy are emotionally driven. So Owen's wearing a lash shirt, probably because he likes to buy or he works there. There's an emotional decision that he wants to fit into the community in which he is in. Otherwise, we'd all relatively be wearing the same thing. The piece of this, though, that a lot of people miss is that every decision that happens in the workplace, whether someone wants to follow you as a leader or, or sorry, be a follower of you as a leader or engage with you at work and do different stuff is based on the subconscious. It's based on an emotional decision. Do I like this person or do I not like this person? Do I trust this person? Do I not trust this person? It's not, this person is really, really great at their job, and so I want to be connected to them. That won't last long. If you make the emotional connection, you engage with them with cognitive empathy, you actually form a friendship, you actually connect with them, then in a way, you will be a leader to that person. So, to give a chance for uh, some questions, if anyone has questions, uh, maybe you don't, maybe this is boring. Uh, the other two sections of the book are working smarter. One of the big pieces that a lot of people miss is uh, actually having impact. So again, corporations exist to make money, full stop. So if you aren't creating massive impact inside your organization and doing a bunch of little things, you aren't going to get to the place that you want to go. Maybe your, your place that you want to go is just the individual contributor role that you are in. You're happy with that and that is fine. If you want to move up the chain, if you want to become a director, a chief, or whatever, you have to be able to create massive impact. Massive financial impact. Either you are saving the company buttloads of money or you are making the company a buttloads of money more. 
those two things will what be separates you from everyone else. Because a lot of people focus their energy on a hundred different things. And so the, the way to success in, frankly, anything is take your energy, pick the one thing that's going to be the winner, that's going to get the most return, most financial return, or most whatever return, and focus your life and your work career on that point, and then drive that home to create the millions of dollars of impact. There's a lot of things that, that I have done in my career, watched other people have done in the career, where it's, oh, I'm going to save the company a couple thousand dollars. Well, to build the tool to save a couple thousand dollars, it costs $40,000. So how does saving $2,000 every year help us at all? If you could build a tool that would save the company a million dollars, and that costs $100,000 to build, that's massive impact. If you weren't working towards that, you'd be stuck in the same position for a very long time. Agile is another component that I really like. It's uh, a relative framework or methodology that typically gets tossed into uh, building uh, software. But Agile is also a great way to learn. The whole premise of Agile is empiricism, which means that anything that happens, you need data to drive the decisions that you make. So if you go through your career and you don't take any chances, don't make any decisions, don't uh, try to do new stuff, you will never learn. So Agile is a methodology in which you can find ways to learn very quickly versus trying to just do one thing forever and not make the advancements you want because you're not learning along the way. Other one is ask for forgiveness, not permission. Uh, this one is relatively simple. It's about taking risks. Don't go and sign a contract to work with an external company for a million dollars if you are not in a position to sign a contract for a million dollars. But if you can buy something that will save the company some money, or you can sign a contract for 10000 because that's within your role, or maybe it's not, you just do it once to see if you get your hands slapped, and you don't, and it ends up being a success, you learned kind of that area in which you're allowed to take risks. If you sign that contract, you got your hands slapped, then maybe try signing a five thousand dollar contract and see where that lays out, and then find that area in which you can operate. Because most people in leadership positions do not have the time and do not want to micromanage unless they don't trust the people. Then I would argue that they're probably not in the right position because they aren't taking ownership and teaching people the way they need to. Uh, but if you continue to ask for permission on anything, you're always going to be put behind that person who is giving you the permission to do the stuff, and you aren't going to take the risk, which means you aren't going to learn, which means you're going to be stuck in the same role for a very long time. As you grow. Once you get out of that individual contributor role, then you need to be excellent at building teams. You need to be able to get the most out of other people. So going back to the comment about massive impact, you can only have a finite level of impact relatively by yourself. But if you build a team, and you build teams of teams of teams, you have exponential ability to have impact on an organization the higher up you go. I already talked about micromanagement. And then another very small but very big piece is how to have a one-on-one -on -one that connects back to cognitive empathy. Uh, the way that I've always run one-on-ones is saying every other week we are going to talk. People that report directly to me, if I have people underneath that, I will meet with them once a month. And then their, their uh, managers meet with them every other week or whatever cadence you want to set up. Anytime I step into a one-on-one, -on -one, I have zero agenda. Zero agenda. It is their chance to talk to me, to help me solve their problems, and to be a snowplow to get stuff out of their way. If you're doing anything else and you are berating them every one-on-one -on -one or coaching them every one-on-one, -on -one, if that's not the format of the one-on-one -on -one and you didn't coach them when the problem actually happened, then you are wasting the opportunity to grow that person and let them build trust in you for uh, allowing them to build their career and have trust and ownership in what they're doing. So that was it. Um, open it up for conversation. I think there's like 15 minutes left. Uh, if you haven't bought the book, you can get it at this website, hopefully. It was down there today for no reason. Um, any questions?
Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I think change is the key word there. And so it's it's finding the unique and individual situations and building what is possible within those. So if you have, um, as an example, let's say you work in a factory and you are a lineman that takes care of multiple people building whatever. They have to be there every day. And you say, all of a sudden, I want to work from home because everyone else gets to work from home. I want to work from home. It doesn't work in that situation because there is a emotional connection to you being there every day. There's a level of trust to help those people if they were to have issues. And so it's about kind of taking the methodology and, and bending it and, and figuring out in which situations is possible. Someone like that, you may have to say, we can't do this, you have to be here, here are the reasons why. Help to get them understand, help understand why they think they want to work from home. Maybe they have childcare issues because their spouse got laid off and they don't have a way to take care of their kids. Look to help find resolutions with whatever is possible. Let them know that they've been heard. There's, uh, in the one-on-ones you have opportunity to help them feel heard 100% of the time, but you don't always have to act on everything that they request from you. And so within that, it's about letting them know and say, hey, I've heard you, I feel you, we can't do anything about this particular situation, but we can in these areas. Let's get creative to see if there's something that we can do, maybe adjust your schedule one way or the other, put in some different hours or something. Uh, but going back to, to the other part of the question, within the generational piece, absolutely. Like we see people like, I would be in the office, we're starting to see a lot of people who are in leadership positions that are uh, in their 40s and 50s saying, we want everyone back in the office, which there's a fair amount of data that says, we need these people back in the office because it actually hinders uh, creativity and innovation by having not having them in the office, but that doesn't have to mean everyone. You can have them, it's about like adjusting to each situation and helping make sure that they feel heard that and that the situation that they are in is what is going to help them be successful and also be within the company. But then potentially having a conversation like, if you don't want to do these things and you don't want to be here, let's find a different spot for you so that we can adjust. It's just like it's it's there's a bit a bit of nuance to all of it. If I may follow up. To yeah. That, um, I love your story, but I'm wondering if you could expand on this part where I mean you took a big step in your own leadership journey. Right? It's not a static thing. It's not you, you just can't walk into this room and have this empathy and have these conversations with mm-hmm. people who may be. Very different from you, you know. Well, maybe now teen, just teenagers, right? Mm-hmm. Very different. You just can't walk in that room and just listen, right? You had to take an extra step and say, "Hey, I needed to grow and I needed to develop." And you took this hiatus where you just read all these books and like expanded your own knowledge and understanding of the space. Mm-hmm. I'm just wondering if you can expand and just talk a little bit about you know that process is developing as a leader and like taking those extra steps and just continuing to grow around you know those new situations that you're presented with. Yeah, it, part of it was uh, my own ego of wanting to be successful. That that 360 review was proving or showing to me in a very data-centric way that I was not being successful in a lot of the things that I thought that I was. Uh, but going into that, it's about having ownership and being open and vulnerable. If you're going to have a one-on-one and expect other people to be open and vulnerable with you, then you need to be the same in return. So there's a lot of times that I've had coworkers uh, describe part of my humor as self-deprecating which I think is something that allows me to, in a way, position myself and connect to other people because I don't hold myself up here and I don't ever really speak of myself in that way. And so going on that journey was significant because it, it changed my career and it helped change the career of a lot of other people. Uh, but it, it, the big piece of it, I think, is just being open and honest with the people around and say, like, hey, I'm not great at these things. And not being a politician where I say, like, I have to live this line because this is the belief I've always had and if I change it, I'm going to be called a flip-flopper, and then my political career is going to be over. But you're not going to engage and grow followers if you can't grow and engage with other people. Is that, is that going to answer the question? No. It's a good idea. Yeah. Cool. So I was, I was wondering if you, um, if in the dynamic corporate leader method, if the, you know, the fundamental principles are probably the same, but have you explored any practical differences between leading a remote team versus an in-person and office team? There definitely is, uh, and that's something we've been fighting recently. I have not uh, engaged much with it, but uh, as, as far as trying to help figure out a solution, but the solution that I go through ultimately always, always ends up being that empathy route with a design thinking spin to it, figuring out why people uh, or how people can connect, like what level of emotional connection do people need. So I have, uh, as an example, one of the people I work with now has a very high need to feel connected to everyone on the team. Like, wants to be friends with everyone on the team, wants to be able to have an emotional uh, relationship, 
within work bounds uh, with everyone on the team. Whereas I have engineers that absolutely just want to be left the alone. Like 8.5 hours a day, they do not want anyone talking to them because they want to write code. And so the big piece of that is then finding ways to help bring people together that uh, creates a connectedness. So we started out trying to do uh, 20 minute coffee time every Wednesday, just to get everyone to connect. Um, it did work out because it was just everyone was like dead air silence. And then we found out that everyone liked games. So we started playing games once a week for about 45 minutes online. We play Heads Up or a bunch of different games that are integrated into Zoom. Uh, and it's, it's, it's tricky. Uh, I don't know the answer, but it's like relative to the situation. I don't know if that answers your question much. Yeah, I'm just curious if you've been thinking about that. It, a lot, like, because I, I enjoy being in person and I struggle a little bit being remote. Uh, so I found that like two-ish weeks for myself without human contact with people I work with is a really long time. So that I travel to Iowa City to make that connection, which is my way of getting over that. Uh, but then we just, it's kind of that individual example I gave earlier on. How do we nuance this for every single person? Yes. So I, I want to commend you for uh, sending an email pretty much as we were starting this. I was impressed. I watched your book a couple of days ago. Your automated email service oh. is uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> sending yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I've like eleven every day. Yes. Yeah, yeah, eleven. Yeah, we'll let for eleven. Yeah, right before the but yeah, yeah. We <laughs> get about thirty of them written. So you'll be entertained for about a month. There you go. All right. Um, I, I haven't read it yet, but I'm. Uh, I printed it off and it's sitting on the desk. So awesome. I'm ready to get into it. I do have a, uh, I don't know, I, I think the purpose of a corporation in my mind uh, is to bring something of value to society. However, no corporation can stay in business mm -hmm. if it's not bringing, you know, making money right. to, to value itself. So one of the things that, that, that I heard you say over and over again, and we've heard in the, in the media, we've heard... You know, that person from Facebook who testified in front of Congress the other day, you know, Facebook's purpose is, is to make money. And if you interview the founders, I, I can't imagine any founder who would tell you that the entire reason I started this company is to make money. Is that it, the purpose of the corporation is to bring a benefit to society mm -hmm. so that people will pay you for that benefit. Right. And, and of course, you need that payment in order to keep going. Right. right. Uh, so it, it, this is one of the things that, that you said in the... And you, and you hit it over and over again. I'm sure it's in the book, and I'll, you know, I'll yeah. send you comments after I'm done reading it. Yeah, it's, I would love that. It's, um, it's, it's a very vicious cycle because they don't exist to make money, but they can't exist without money. Exactly. So, therefore, they exist to make money. Yes. Yeah. The, the founder of our company, um, you know, made a comment to me when I was a young engineer coming right out of school. He said, "Bill, ARA is not in business to make money. We make money so we can stay in business." Mm -hmm. And and that's how we run the company from the day it was created. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of blessed in that we're a 100% employee-owned company, so you you get ownership by every employee because every employee is an owner. There's not even a person who owns 1% of our company, right. which is really a cool business model. But but I, I I just struggled with some of what you were saying mm -hmm. in the in the talk because you know the purpose isn't money. The money is what makes the purpose happen. Right. The purpose is a good to society because as a corporation, if you're not doing a good to society. You're out of business. Nobody wants to talk to you. Nobody wants to do business with you. You're done. You're out. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I really, you know, the, the tools, when, when I bought the book, it came with, of course, a couple of extra tools and little videos and what have you. Um, so for those of you who have it, there's some pretty cool stuff in there. Uh, and actually, you actually, uh, in your one of your sections, one of the sets of videos, got me thinking better about KPIs uh, and what performance indicators I'm using for our business and am I using the right ones in the right way, and the way you group them, I think are excellent. So I sure, uh, yeah. great, great stuff. Yeah, it, it, like I said, it's, it's a vicious cycle because the, the example I give with Tesla is they are helping create a better uh, environment for climate, but ultimately they can't do that without money. Yeah. So, so in my mind, corporations exist to make, like they have to make money. And yes. so if you want to be an employee and you are firmly behind the mission of what you guys are, which it sounds like you are, mm -hmm. if you want to continue that mission, you have to find ways to make new financial impact, which ultimately, ends up being to benefit of the customer. Yes. But where the, the disconnect tends to be and, and has happened in many large corporations where I'm at is the ego piece comes into play to say, I'm gonna build this because I think this is what our customers need. And it never ends up actually being the case. And everyone has a ton of great ideas, but there are very few great ideas that actually end up being implemented. 
is like 97% of businesses fail. But the same thing can be said of new businesses with inside businesses or features or products with inside businesses. Most of them fail. That's where Agile is a great teacher because it helps you move quicker through that iteration of learning what exactly it is that this person at the end wants. Yeah, wise, wise man once told me many years ago, I have a lot of great ideas. The trouble is most of them suck. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, from that C Jack example you gave, um, what do you think that the most fundamental change you have to make within yourself to 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 more develop your ego? Ego. For me, it was ego, ego 100. I thought I was great and knew everything, and then once I started reading books, I realized I didn't know shit. I still don't know shit, and that is the path I hope to continue on. Um, that. It was a very humbling experience reading that book of like of extreme ownership for at least for me. I don't know if other people have read it. I'm sure you have other scenarios in your life, uh, but ego was a big piece of that where I felt that I was right and I was always going to be right, and I didn't need to work on myself because I was a super intelligent person. And if you don't get over that, other people aren't going to follow. Other people aren't going to trust you. I had good relationships, but that it wasn't as strong as what I thought. Because as you saw with that diagram, I wasn't effectively leading them in a way that they really cared about or I was able to connect with them and, and make impact inside the company. Yeah. You, know, you talk about this, but uh, uh, for example, uh, you talk about trust, mm -hmm. and how to generate trust, leader. So uh, let other people trust and then they follow you. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, uh, but, I'm, uh, but one of the things I think that uh, for a team to interact to each other and collaborate uh, is uh, also trust between <coughs> each other. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering how you generate, uh, because we have been trained from this community so on more in the individualism mm -hmm. piece uh, yep. sometimes. So, how do you generate not trust on you, but trust in the team members, each other, so they, they can uh, risk, yep. risk to, to talk, risk to share, so, because trust you have to risk, so. Yep, 100%. So there is, um, in the portion on getting the most out of others, I should have detailed the kind of subsections of that, uh, but it's, it's very much creating trust within the team. So as the person who, uh, if you are the boss or the manager, you inherently have authority over them. And there is a, uh, I don't want to necessarily call it leadership, but you are in a, a somewhat of a leadership position and people will effectively listen to you until they do not want to or until you get them to not want to. You're in a better position if you can get them to actually follow you and, and be a part of your team and be interconnected. But within that team, if you demoralize, uh, Let's say we we're in a meeting right here and you said something and I said that is the dumbest idea in the world. That immediately shuts everyone else in the room up. And so it starts with the person who is leading the group to inspire and give people the ability to be open and honest with their actions. But that comes starting with you and then uh, like kind of permeating that throughout the culture. So it's not as much as you need to have everyone be one-to-one -one, the same that you are with all of your employees, but the consciousness of the room needs to be that everyone can speak up and do things to effectively push the company forward or push a project forward or whatever without being uh, chastised for the decisions and stuff that they make. And so it's like, just kind of, it starts with the person at the top and then can permeate throughout. And there's a multitude of ways in which you can do that, but a lot of it has to do with the culture that you set within that team. And then also uh, taking care of the bad actors because it's, it's not so much what you say you allow, it's what you actually allow that sets the tone. And so if you have someone that maybe it wasn't me that said that was a dumb idea, somebody else across the room did, if I allow that to continue to go forward, then it again shuts the rest of the team down. And you effectively have a bully on the team which destroys that, that culture and that ability to innovate. Yeah. Did anyone have other topics? Yeah. Good, all right. Good. Thank you for those, Kevin. Thank <laughs> you.